if they want to ask me a question, I definitely kind of do a little background look <laughs> at how they speak and what they post before I respond. That way I know I have as many eggs in my baskets as possible <laughs> and I do it in a way that will have the most successful outcome. Most of us are trying to elevate the hobby, pediculture, and the way to do it is through science. You know, it's not through what you can breed. It's it's through the science and the animal's actual behavior and what they, their instincts and what they're actually meant to do, not just make pretty babies. <laughs> so I definitely think using studies is the way to go to elevate the hobby as a whole. So to build upon that, I like that, by the way, so to build upon that and not being in your echo chamber, it's great if your echo chamber is all about like using science and, and going with the science. But how is important is it that we exist outside of our echo chambers and maybe the groups that aren't so science based, shall we say? And is it important that you are making points and backing things up with science to install the culture in these fringe areas as well or is that not your responsibility you shouldn't take that upon yourself where do you draw the line um heart hitting questions a... jesus <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Reptiles and Research Podcast. My name is Liam Sinclair, and in today's episode, we have Victoria Teague, who's gone from just getting into the hobby to going through a personal journey and how she learns a keeper to then becoming the admin or advancing herpetological husbandry, which is, in my opinion, the best Facebook group on Facebook for reptiles, bar none. The most scientific, the most academic, the most advanced. I am also an admin, so I know Victoria personally, but this episode got really, really deep and layered and reflective, and we talk about communication skills and how we can best help people and what's the best way to approach scenarios. Victoria is on a whole other wavelength. She researches into people's past posts before she even interacts with someone to get a feel of how this person communicates, whether they are short-tempered, whether they are really relaxed, and she c caters her style and talking to the person in the moment. But then she doesn't just comment. She rewrites and crafts a response and a helpful comment over and over and over again in the notes on her phone until she gets a perfect response to be as helpful and in the best way, style of communicating to help that individual person. She's operating on another echelon that I currently don't exist at and I don't think many other admins or moderators of any Facebook groups are either. So I really enjoyed picking the brains of Victoria here. I got really reflective and we got really honest and transparent and I asked for a lot of feedback in the way that I communicate and we got the conversation just gets really deep. It's got to be one of my top fives so far. I'm really proud to have had this conversation for my own personal development, but let alone for hopefully you guys will enjoy it too as well. Thank you so much to Custom Raptor Habitats for sponsoring us. They are helping make all of this possible. You can find the links to them in the video description. Thank you to everyone that continues to turn up to our Patreon show, Keeper Chats. It's amazing to touch base with you guys face to face each month. Your support in running the channel is really appreciated. If you would like to join us over on Patreon, you can join us at patreon.com slash reptiles and research. And finally, if you enjoy our content, please share it on social media to help other nerdy keepers like you. But enough of that, let's welcome Victoria Teague. Welcome to the GoFundMe for the Ball Python Deep Dive Project. This is an episodic docu-series. We want to include all the relevant studies on ball pythons and then weave that into the story, weave that into the journey of discovery for the viewer. But this isn't just a documentary, we're doing real science at the same time. So we're creating an international study on how ball pythons use their enclosures. And then finally, we want to analyze 
all the interpretations, all the footage of wild animals, bring it all together, extract the data from studies, look at this holistic viewpoint and then identify the gaps and go out to Ghana ourselves and film those gaps. We want to go to Ghana with a team of professionals and film bull pythons in the wet season. Will there be so much flooding that bull pythons are forced to climb for refuge? Or will they just be moving in their environment? Let's find out. Either way, we'll show what we find. This is something of an order of magnitude that has never been done before. We want to set a new bar and put it right up here. So if you would like to help in any way to make this possible, then please check out the GoFundMe. Well, thank you for joining me. This is a this is a it's an episode that I think is quite interesting. So we're gonna go at things from a different angle than we normally do, which I'm quite excited for. So obviously I know who you are by now. I think I should should know who you are by now. Both of us are admins on the Advancing Herbological Husbandry admin team. Um, but what I wanted to explore in this episode is your journey as a keeper, because you've taken a completely different route or route, whatever you want to say, um, to me into all of this, which is uh, this is what I want to investigate. So before we dive into it, could you please uh, say hello to our listeners and introduce yourself? Hello, <laughs> I'm Victoria Teague. Um, I've been in the hobby since 2017. I'm very active in the Facebook group, and then I also have an Instagram under Passionate Snakes, and then I do do YouTube occasionally, but it is not official. It's just I randomly upload something, and that's how it is. <laughs> What's official anyway? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that's how everyone starts, but just randomly uploading things, and they're like, oh, I like this, and they actually start making it a thing. Yeah, I'd have to get actual equipment. <laughs> yeah, so you obviously were in the military first, weren't you? Yes. Did you have reptiles then, or was it after the military? I got reptiles like towards the end of my contract when I knew I wasn't going to be moving anymore, which was about 2017, and it was a ball python. And during yeah. this time, you obviously... Sorry, I cut you off there, didn't I? No, you're good. Keep going. Uh, all I was going to say is, and obviously during this time, you've joined the hobby now. You've got yourself an animal. This is before you've gone on to do any sort of qualifications. Um, so you've gone a different route to me. I obviously did qualification first and joined the hobby. So when you join this world that's so all over the place and it's hard to find the correct information... What was that like for you? Oh boy, it was a lot. For me, at least in 2017, YouTube was like popping off as far as reptile videos. I think that's when it was really starting to go crazy. And it was all over my feed. A lot of Ryan Barchak, a lot of that side of reptile keeping, which is why I was like, oh my gosh, a ball python. That would be so cool. And then I got one and I was like, oh, maybe uh, it wasn't as cool as the YouTubers told me it was. <laughs> so you just weren't into it? Yeah, it was. Well, it was complicated because I got the animal first after just seeing the YouTube side of things, which was a lot of racks, a lot of bare basics. So I thought, in my head when I got this 40 gallon breeder that I was, you know, doing it different. And then I actually realized there was Facebook groups and community chats and things like that. And I joined the wrong ones before I found the advancing side of things. So I came in with my 40 gallon breeder, you know, got told it was absolutely god awful, which it probably was. <laughs> And I basically was joining those groups in hopes of learning how to do things better than what I was seeing. And it was the complete opposite. And I was basically how to taught how to do less instead of taught how to do more. If that makes sense. So then I was kind of disappointed with how that all went out. So you started going down to some a more... Um minimalistic route 
Yes. And I felt it wasn't correct. But how do I tell these people that I didn't agree when I had no experience or anything to back that up? I just felt like the snake should have more than this. But they were telling me I was going to have bad sheds and it wasn't going to eat. I was like, okay, well, I guess I have to do what's quote unquote best for the animal. And it just kind of ruined that whole first experience for me. I think a lot of keepers coming into reptile keeping experience something similar to that and obviously get taken down a a path of this minimalistic care. And if you if someone tells you that your animal is going to have bad sheds or go off feed or not thrive or God forbid even die, then you can completely understand why someone might go down this route. And then obviously over time people become entrenched in the idea of this because it's something that it's all they've been taught and it's all they've ever known. So when you get told the opposite, then it's very challenging to uh, travel back down the path you've came. The way I like to think about it is like a big hill and there's this ball at the top of the hill. And then once this ball rolls down the hill, it's very difficult to push it back up. Yes. Yes. And then by the time I started to see that there was another side of doing things. It was like going from one extreme to the other. And then I was just overwhelmed and I was like, okay, I need to take a step back and really analyze like what I'm trying to do here. Like am I I'm just trying to have a healthy pet, but there's a lot more going on than just that. So I did end up rehoming the ball python and then I kind of stepped out for a year. And I was just like a lurker in all of these groups. For a year straight, I was just seeing what everyone was discussing, what everyone was fighting about, what everyone was saying was right, saying was wrong. And then I was just looking deeper into species aside from, oh, this is, this looks interesting. Like I was more so looking into the behavior aspect of a species and what I was wanting out of it as a pet instead of, I just want a snake. I'm going to go get a snake. So you were trying to fit it into your lifestyle and the behavior into your lifestyle as well and what your yes. interests and needs are. That is something that doesn't get spoken about enough. So what? let's just trickle back a little bit. So what was it about the bull python that just you didn't really get on with was it because it was very it, it, was this in like a glass tank still it was for a few months until i felt like i was between like i didn't have issues with feeding or shedding necessarily but it was like the anxiety of constantly being told something was going to go wrong that made me go to a tub setup and it was literally like the locking tub lid and I had a heat mat underneath and it was just, I just felt like this wasn't what I was trying to have. Like this is not the experience I was trying to have and it was just very overwhelming. And then you got, you moved on that animal before you got to really keep it in any other sort of style, I'm assuming. Yes, no. Because I was thoroughly convinced that I was doing everything wrong and that there was no other way to do things. So I was like, okay, well, if this is not the animal that I can keep in the way I'm trying, then I guess this animal is just not meant for me. And obviously that's not the truth. But at that point in time, I did not know there was another way. And I hadn't been exposed to that side of keeping yet. Otherwise, I think it would have gone differently. Yeah, it's very interesting that you say about like you just really didn't enjoy keeping in that tub style. I actually have my bull python Maroa in a locking lid tub, as you describe, literally down by me right now. And I can tell you that she is not herself in that tub. And I know that because I do get her out to exercise her and let her move and roam. Now, the reason that she's still in there, just for anyone listening, is that she's passed two nidovirus um, tests as negative. I'm going for a third. Two of the fecal screens have come back negative, clear and everything. I'm going for a third. So now I'm starting to like let her come out and exercise and cruise and stuff because 
I'm pretty sure she's clean, but I'm going through all the steps to make sure. But anyway, that's why I'm still keeping her in there before I get her in like the Viv step, because this is going to be her Viv behind me. Um, for people watching, people listening, that's going to be a bit confusing, but there's a spare Vivarian behind me, basically. And her behavior out of the out of the tub and being able to cruise shows elements of her personality and her brain and the way she chooses to interact. She is not herself in the tub. And I can tell that by just how intelligent and and problem solving she is out of the tub. Now at the top of my landing, I don't know if you ever saw, you saw the video of her like periscoping in the hallway. Oh yes, I saw it. So in the landing there's like a bend around this wall and then down the start of the stairs there's this banister. Now she was going up the wall and I could tell she was looking at this banister and she was like going towards it. But she stopped and paused, looked at it, moved her head around a few times, and I th- I saw her realise that she wasn't able to reach it without like falling over. So what she did was move to the left, curl a, a segment of her like first upper half around the bend of this wall, and then moved across around the side of the wall up towards the rings of metal holding the wooden banister so she realized and plotted a path and then acted upon it and that is a level of intelligence that most people would never recognize in a ball python but because if you keep in a way that limits their potential then you're only going to see this upper capped level of potential that you obviously have put them in now i would never know that she was that intelligent unless i actually let her do that but even me knowing like snakes are intelligent and put them in vivariums, she blew me away because I saw her problem solve and plan a route. And I'd never seen that like from a bull python before. And I, I mean, like when they cruise in their enclosures, yes, they use the same branches over and over again. They learn a, they learn a path. But to actually watch her be in an environment for the first time, look around, plot her path, and then go and do it, that was surprising for me. That was very intelligent from her as well now i i think you probably didn't really get to see that animal's full personality in that tub which is why you were obviously so there's like this lackluster experience for you i yes. wonder what experience you would have had with that animal if you got to see more of his personality yes i agree i think it would have been completely different And I think people who are coming into the hobby now, like within the past year, are having it so much better. (laughs) I feel like the amount of information is just everywhere. Like the information you actually want (laughs) to elevate your care and to have those experiences with the animals where you realize like this is an actual living intelligent being and I'm caring for it and I should do more than just the essentials. Yeah, I completely agree. It's very interesting that your animal was doing perfectly fine. It was feeding and shedding. And just the constant words being thrown at you that it will happen, it will happen, caused you to actually change a system that was actually working. Yes, definitely not what would happen now. I just think I did not have the confidence then that I do now, nor the experience, obviously. And it was just, I don't know, just words are powerful, especially when you're being told that your animal's going to suffer and possibly die or have to go to the vet and be tube fed because it's not going to eat or have to be stuck in these humidity boxes because it's not shedding properly. And, and it's just, it was very intense (laughs) i just think i was definitely in the wrong places so at what point did you get to a point where you saw that there was more what was it that you found that was like this turning point for you to explore another path um it was actually kind of interesting because coming from Like our admin side of things, we're always supposed to be like patient and non-confrontational. But really, I wasn't involved in the argument, but it was reading an argument between two people. Um, And I remember the lady's name was Nicole. I don't know. I can't remember her last name, and I'm not sure if she's still active in these groups. But they were having a very heated discussion about ball pythons. 
and she was vouching for not just a pet rock, and the gentleman was vouching for rack keeping and basically saying she was delusional and all these things. It was a very heated argument, but it was the first time I saw that there was groups dedicated to advancing care, advancing husbandry, and that was like probably my first turning point. And from there, I just kept getting more and more exposure to this other side of keeping. Were there any sort of like feelings? Obviously, you've seen something like that, and someone's describing something as like delusional and this like crazy way of doing things, and how she must be doing something wrong. And obviously, you've got all this past history and memory of all these people telling you that the opposite. When you were like, going down this rabbit hole were there these feelings of like oh i shouldn't be doing this 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 isn't actually right or this is wrong sort of thing what do you mean i'm sorry i'm just because there must be some sort of like feeling of apprehension of almost like taking a leap from something opposing what the vast majority were telling you at the time it must have been quite scary to Oh, honestly, I was excited. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is exactly what I was hoping for in the first place. Like, how did I not know this existed before? Or like, why was it so hidden? Like, it, it seemed like this was the first time I saw someone actually speaking out against that type of keeping. And obviously, she was meeting a lot of fight back. But it was just like, oh, there's actually a whole group of people on the other side of the spectrum. And I was just in this side of things where I wasn't getting the exposure to them. And I just remember feeling like, oh, I want to join. I want to see what they're talking about. I want to see the things that she's saying. Like, I want to see this whole other side of keeping. It was just exciting to see that conversation. It was also a little confusing, but ultimately, I definitely joined right away, and I was just immediately digesting everything I could. I was going through all the posts. I was typing keywords in the search bar, and it was just like like a high to learn all these new things that was that didn't feel so stagnant. This fresh new place, almost. Yes. <laughs> so going from that then, you obviously here's a question for you. Were there any feelings of like, oh, I wish I hadn't got rid of that royal now, the double python now? Um in the beginning, yes. But then the more I started to get exposed to like other species and their type of behaviors. I think there's a lot a royal would check off on my list, but I think it wouldn't necessarily fit all of the boxes I was looking for. So in a way, I'm sort of glad it happened that way because I'm not the type of person who... I don't know. I don't think I would have rehomed if I knew what I knew now. But in a way, I'm glad it happened because it led me to discovering different species. I'll put it that way. Mm, understandable. So you mentioned you've got this like list of attributes. I'm assuming you haven't actually got like an actual list. It's more like a mental general vibe that you're going for. But could you just, right. just describe the sort of general attributes that you're looking for of like your sort of list? Definitely something very display, like an animal that's going to be out most of the time. And uh, honestly, yeah, there's a, a couple species I have that don't fit that mark, <laughs> but I made some exceptions. Um, but I really wanted an animal where most of the time I would walk into the room and it would just be there. And almost all of mine are like that. And then... Just something very interactive, curious. And again, I think these are all things that can also be found in a royal as well. It's just I was looking for something 
different, I suppose. And in some ways larger. I definitely wanted something a little bigger. And now I'm kind of doing the opposite where everything I'm getting now is smaller. <laughs> but yeah. And it's Lori's work has definitely been a big influence on how I make decisions as far as animals go. Lori Terini. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So Lori's one of those people where she is standing at the pinnacle of something huge and she stands there near enough alone because there aren't many people that are as good as Lori and aren't even doing the same thing. There might be in other other worlds like dog training or horses or but with the snakes, she stands there alone, really. And as an, a, a social media educator, too, yet she's so hidden for the most part. There should be someone that's, you know, a million subscribers. That everyone's like, oh, my God. But it doesn't seem to be the case, which is uh, sad, but also fascinating at the same time. I think... Lori is a whole different breed. <laughs> she is amazing and something that I think everyone should inspire to be like. But it is also very intimidating. <laughs> what I would say about it is it is a skill set that you have to learn. People think, oh, I'm going to train my reptile and the, the reptile has to learn. But actually, all of the learning is you need to learn how to train and you need to learn how your behavior and your actions communicate what you're trying to communicate. So I think a lot of people don't really realize they need to invest time in learning themselves and upgrading themselves as a keeper with the skill set to even train the reptile. They think of it at the opposite angle of like, oh yeah, the, this this reptile needs to learn something, not realizing like there's this whole skill set that you need to download almost before you can actually do it successfully yes Lori actually helped me pick my carpet python <laughs> oh really yeah and i did successfully teach my carpet target training um my boa is not quite there she just wants to eat the target so it is something we're working on yeah, I understand that. I've got I've got king snakes, particularly this one in here. He's just it's a California king snake, and you can imagine what he's like. Yeah, it's been yes. I think there's so many things we can learn from reptiles in general, as well as like what you spoke about the training mindset, but also patience and observation skills. And just being more creative and thinking outside of the box. And I think that's another part of Lori's work that I really admire is just how complex and enriched her enclosures are without them being bioactive, slice of nature, pinnacle. Because I feel like that's something a lot of people think their enclosure needs to be to meet that functionality, and it doesn't. I mean, bioactive is beautiful. It's amazing, and I do enjoy it, but you do not need to have that to have a fully functioning, enriched enclosure that's going to make your snake thrive. 100% agree with that. Like, this this enclosure behind me, it's not bioactive because it's, like, the next up, step up for the snake's care. It's bioactive because I like the look of it. Yeah. If the all the other ones are on up here as a male MBK, he is on Aspen essentially, and she's on up there as just soil, and the bearded dragon's on sand. So the functionality of the substrate is just substrate and burrowing and microclimate, which can be achieved with obviously like the microclimate with like a humid hide as well. I've done that because it looks beautiful, and. It's not necessarily because it adds much more to the snake's welfare than the functionality I've got in the other enclosures. Yes, I agree. I did full bioactive for most of mine, but I actually find myself kind of going backwards. And now I'm kind of doing this naturalistic, but using live potted plants instead, just because I like the freedom of being able to rearrange things 
And I've found that to be very enriching for the snakes as well. When I kind of switch things around, add new wood, take old wood out, new hides. Maybe I'll add some a hide that's buried and a hide on top. Like I just like being able to completely change the landscape, so to speak, and give them something that feels new while it's still being the same home they've been in. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, in terms of what you keep, so what is it you've got now? You've got a carpet python. A, is it a boa constrictor? Yes, boa imperator. Yes. And I think I, I think I can guess what you've got. Is it a boa <laughs> constrictor? Uh, uh, a boa, the carpet. Is it a Japanese rat snake? Yes. Yes. Uh, is it a um? Oh, what are they called? I know what it looks like. I can see it in my head. The Mandarin? Yes. And then you've got a a Mountain King? Yes. Is there anything I missed? Nope, that's it for now. <laughs> there is two more species I'm trying to add. Ooh, or I plan that? on adding. I want a file snake so bad. Really? They just fascinate me. I don't know what it is. But I have been wanting one for two years now, and I keep putting it off because I keep telling myself, oh, I need to upgrade this snake or, oh, I need to do this first. And I'm finally getting to that point where I'm running out of excuses <laughs> of not to get it. So I'm getting close to that. And then I also want a rhino rat snake. And then I'm calling it quits unless something truly magical falls out of the sky and I can't contain myself. So you're stopping at how many animals is that? So that would be seven. Seven? You're stopping at seven? Yes. See, there's an element of that as well that I'd like to explore. The huge, you've got rather large enclosures and a small amount of animals. And would you say you're entirely fulfilled by that? Yes. I I mean, obviously, it's all for the animals, but enclosure design, enclosure layout, that is something I thrive off of. I absolutely love that. That is my bread and butter of the reptile keeping hobby. It is everything I think about. <laughs> I have notes on my phone and I have diagrams where I've like hand drawn ideas. And I'm just always trying to create something beautiful but functional. So you've got to this sort of stage now where you are you sure there's not any itch? There's no itch for like, oh, I really want like a a few more or a bigger collection or that's not there at all, no? My itch is bigger enclosures. <laughs> like I want to have something that looks like it is in a zoo but it is in my house. <laughs> I love that so much. That is like my goal in life is to have like that wow factor, like just for myself, not necessarily people walk in and they're like, wow, but I want to walk in the room and be like, wow, I really did this. Like I accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish. The animals are utilizing everything I've provided. And I just want to sit there and take it all in every day. <laughs> That is my goal. That sounds very, very pure. So you've got to this sort of stage now, but let's go back a little bit. So, so are there any moments in your your sort of learning journey into like herpt culture and reptile keeping that you thought of a real turning points? Obviously, you say um, the one argument that you witnessed, and then finding Laura Torini. Is there anything other than that that you thought like that was a big step in the direction that I took? Um. So when I when I got like back back into the hobby with my boa imperator, for lack of a better term, she was my guinea pig because I did all kinds of things with her. I she went through like four different enclosures in the span of two years. I tried all types of heating. I went from like a heat mat to a radiant heat panel, CHE, halogen, EP projector. I 
was going crazy with equipment and using wooden enclosures, glass, plastic, PVC. She went through it all. <laughs> Bless her heart. But she was a trooper through it all. And it was just seeing, like, going to that next step and then just waiting. Like, I would add something new or I would change to a different style of heating. And then I would just watch and wait to see how she would react to things or if it changed any of her behaviors. I even did like water features versus regular bowls. At one point, she had like a waterfall trickle down the side of one of the walls. Wow. Um, yeah, she didn't care for it. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 looked, it looked super interesting, but because I had... It was um it was like a five gallon mini water feature and, and the water would trickle down the wall and then I had a regular water bowl on the other end. And she would never use the water feature. She would just go to the regular bowl. And I even had a security camera like hooked up. And that was a little disappointing, but you know, if that's how she wants it, that's how she wants it. <laughs> and um yeah. It was just seeing the animals move and do things that really gave me that high. Like the same high people experience when they buy a new animal is arguably what I experience when I see them utilizing the new thing I've tried out. So you got your boa and you were like, right, I'm back in this. So you've come into this with this knowledge of I know there's a better way and a more like naturalistic and larger is better style of keeping. Did you do any sort of research with the boa constrictor where you found like conflicting information that you weren't too sure about? Um, definitely as far as UVB goes. And there was like an added challenge in that because she is albino um, and she's the only morph animal I own and so it was also trying to the argument in itself of whether or not a boa needs UVB and then stacked on top of the fact that she was albino and that was pretty fun I ended up using a shade dweller and within I think it was not even a week into it and i ended up getting a picture of her choosing to coil on top of the cork bark hide instead of underneath it and it was under the shade dweller and at that point i had already purchased a um, solar meter so i have the solar meter next to her as i like held the button and it was a uvi of 0 0.6 and I just thought that was the hugest win ever. I was like, oh my God, she's doing it. She's doing the thing. <laughs> she's doing the thing. So you even just went out and just bought a solar meter. Yes. You're one of them people that just puts their money where their mouth is. I like it a lot. Yes, I wanted to be able to actually document it fully and not just have a picture and be like, oh, she's under the shade dweller like i wanted to be able to back it up and actually take a reading instead of it just being oh she's off centered and it's like nothing you know what i mean and i have same pictures as well with um my carpet python under uvb and i have the shade dweller next to her or sorry my carpet python under uvb and i have the solar meter next to her with a reading of 3.1 and then i have Another picture of my mandarin rat snake under UVB, and his was at a 1.0, I believe. I haven't been able to get it with my king snake yet, but we're working on it. Mostly because he's um, not at the point yet where I can put my hand next to him without him getting a little spook. But I have seen him do it. I just, we're working on the point where I can put my hand next to him with the silver meter without him moving. <laughs> that's the point I'm trying to read. So when you were like considering getting the UVB for your boa, your al albino boa as well, al albino, albino, tomato, tomato, 
but you were thinking about doing that. What were people saying that were um, making the waters a bit muddy for you as to whether you should or shouldn't? Um, at that point, I was still in a boa specific group, and it was quite depressing. Um, I actually kind of this is where I started to learn to sort of just lead by example as a casual way to put it. Um, instead of opening the floodgates of discussion, I would just post the picture and I would barely say anything and I would just see what would happen. So like the picture of her under UVB with the solar meter next to it. Um, I just, all I, I think all I wrote in the caption was that it was a shade dweller and that that was the solar meter reading and I said nothing else. <laughs> and I just posted it in the BOA specific group and saw what happened. And honestly, it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. I had like a few people who tol told me it was unnecessary and that she was probably there for heat. Um, and luckily she was still there because I posted it immediately because I was so excited. So luckily she was still there when I started getting those comments. So I also got my temperature gun and pointed it at her and she was 95 degrees. I'm not sure what that is in Celsius. Hold on. I'm on it. <laughs> Don't you worry. You carry on. Okay. <laughs> so, it, and I found she was 95, um, which is a tad higher than what most people recommend in the first place. So it wasn't about her going up there because she was too cold. In fact, she was warmer than what most people would recommend. And she was under the UVB. And when I posted that, those people who told me that she was just going there to seek more heat kind of didn't respond anymore. <laughs> and then, uh, but mostly I got a lot of questions. Like people who were interested were like, oh, what made you do this? Or where did you buy it? How much did it cost? How often does she bask? And it was just um, a much more positive experience than I thought it was going to be. So, I did. Sorry, <laughs> I did end up. <laughs> I did end up leaving that group eventually, though, <laughs> just because it was um, not good for my mental health to be in there. We'll explore that element of it as well. Um, let me get my notepad so that I actually remember. So, first of all, for everyone listening, the ninety-five was thirty-five degrees Celsius. Um. So these people that are asking about, oh, how often does she bask? Why did you do this? Where, where? These are obviously new keepers that were like you, who had never been uh, exposed to this other side. So all of this was completely alien to them. But they were probing and interested just like you so not necessarily everyone was these people that are set in stone and set in their ways they were just people that have been led down a path yes and it was it felt good to be able to answer their question and kind of be their first voice and saying that there was a different way to do things um which kind of started inspiring me to post more in different places and then ultimately led to me making my Instagram account. But yeah, um, it was, I don't know, it just felt good. It felt good to see her using it and it felt good to tell people like this is possible. Like, yes, your boa will actually utilize UVB if you give it to them. Or yes, it is possible to give a low output of UV or an albino. Yeah, it's one of those as well. If an animal's never seen it for a while, they might take six months before they actually fully utilize it. And for someone to have the patience for six months before they've been before they even decide whether it's good or bad, most people, if it doesn't use it straight away, they're like, oh, this is rubbish. I'm turning it off now. Yes. Yeah, that's a difficult I... one, isn't it? Yes, and I think that's still something that's very difficult when you're trying to discuss things with people and they go, oh, well, I tried it and the snake didn't use it. And then you have to be like, well, well, how long did you try it? And then they say, you know, two months or something. 
and then it just kind of feels awkward when you have to tell them, you know, maybe you should have waited a little longer or held out for at least six months or so. And then people tend to get defensive at that point. So there's communication on social media in this style. You have a scenario like that where I have done this before. I've had the same conversation that you're having and they'll be like, oh, yeah, it was this amount of time. Or if their entire premise relies upon them giving a certain answer, they'll just lie in the moment just to just to win the argument, shall we say. Um, how do you communicate in a way that oh, it's just, just difficult, isn't it? Because you don't want to get to this place where it's like, well, if you admit a number, then you've lost. But also... You're trying to have a discussion with them to hopefully open their eyes in a way that's like, oh, maybe I could have tried that. Maybe I'll give it another go sort of thing. But everything turns into a, a, a battle with who's right, because there is ego and there is feelings and emotion in the mix. Um, and that leads into how do you think the best way to approach people in that sort of dialogue is? Oh, no, that's um, a big question. <laughs> I, when I have those conversations, I try to be as, what's the word? I try not to use any words of feeling. I try to avoid all words that might trigger feelings. You know, I avoid things like, you know, Oh, it's so difficult to put into words. The... I understand. <laughs> Just, I try to keep it as casual as possible while also still supplying information. I don't want them to feel like I'm judging them or telling them they're wrong or that they're harming their animal in any way, whether that's, you know, the animal's not at its peak physical fitness because it has nothing to climb on, nothing to do, or it's not at its peak cognitive abilities because there's nothing to stimulate it. It's just sitting in a dark corner all day, every day for 20 years. I, It's easy like in my head to get emotional over certain scenarios and be like, oh my gosh, I wish this person would stop doing this right now. I want them to change right now. But you can't say that without them shutting down and feeling attacked and then they won't be open to hearing what you have to say at all yeah it's, it's a very difficult scenario because obviously obviously the whole point in what i'm trying to do is to help keepers to help their animals and i'm helping animals by helping the keepers that in turn help the animals so i truly believe that is at this point my purpose in life and that it's it's one of them things that on my deathbed i'll be like yeah i did that i spent my life doing something that i was proud of sort of thing so i know i'm very intense but <laughs> so i am very very keen on making myself as efficient as possible and so i'm interested in how i can be more tactful of scenarios so it, here's the difficult that i find so it's knowing when to be very very gentle and with someone or when sometimes you need to be a little bit more stern so example of my own experience of like this just just this channel alone someone commenting about hey i don't understand this or or I've told that I've been told that's wrong. I will reply to a comment and be very gentle and be like, "Hey, you might want to look at this." Da, 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 and, be, and just a guiding hand and just set them on a path. I go read this, and then hopefully they'll hop and skip through things and be like, "Oh, okay, I actually like understand now." But sometimes I think a stone a foot or putting your foot down, should I say, is needed. Like that whole thing that I did about I did a talk about ball pythons where i've spoken about this on other podcasts as well where i'm sure everyone's seen it 
Well, even I was saying about these little things we can do, even as breeders, just to make things better for the animal, first of all. And then when it goes to a pet home, it should have a higher chance of succeeding. Now, when um, that mutation creation went on a whole shebang about it, I was very... I don't necessarily always like responding to things, but sometimes I think you do need to be sterner when you're saying, all right, you're pushing a boundary now. So in a nicer way possible, I replied in a way that said, you can't compete with this conversation. You can't compete with this argument, but none of us actually want this argument. So let's just nip it in the bud sort of thing. So even in these heated arguments you get on Facebook and things like that, it's very difficult to find knowing as and when to adopt what sort of style and it's all about becoming more malleable and adaptable to, to different scenarios and conversations. And that's the skill set I'm really keen to learn. So what I'd be interested in in, in learning is, do you feel that you've learned like a, a skill set in like talking, communicating with different personality types as, you, have you, as you've been navigating and helping people on social media? Yes, you definitely deal with more difficult conversations than me. I applaud you. <laughs> that is is definitely tough. I do not want to be in your situation. <laughs> but um, I do think I have learned to read the room, so to speak, even though we're just reading text um, in people's paragraphs and things without tone or facial expression. There's definitely small things you can pick up on. And especially when it comes to social media, there's also the added benefit of you can click on their profile or see their past posts and kind of get a feel of who they are as a person in general and what they would respond to best as far as your approach in the conversation. I do that pretty often when it comes to someone, not necessarily a novice keeper, but someone who's been around for a while. If they want to ask me a question, I definitely kind of do a little background look <laughs> at how they speak and what they post before I respond. That way I know I have as many eggs in my baskets as possible <laughs> and I do it in a way that will have the most successful outcome. I'd say that I'm not sure if that's a skill or not, but I never considered that before. Yeah, I I think it is a skill because I've never considered to do like a little research trip in their past history and look at their profile before I engage with someone. That is that that that's thinking on a different wave like that is. I like that. So let's let me propose like a hypothetical for you. When you have someone that's like, oh yeah, this is delusional, this is this is nonsense about something that is quite clearly evidence in science and is every day for you know people like me and you do you leave it and be like whatever you know that he's not going to be open to changing or do you engage and have a conversation even if you're doing it in a polite way for the benefit of people watching the conversation like you originally and how you originally started down this path is it wasting your time and energy on someone who's not going to listen or is it for the benefit of people watching, not for the actual person engaging in the conversation? Oh, yes. A hundred percent. Anytime I post something publicly, I always like reread it in a third person point of view. Not necessarily how the person I'm discussing with, but how someone who's not involved may view what I'm saying. Because even if who I'm talking to is not being receptive, despite my best efforts, I know that someone coming in from the outside would be able to read my response, understand it in plain terms, be intrigued by it, and possibly want to learn more or engage in the conversation as well. Yeah, it's it's definitely a skill set. And I think that a lot of people could really benefit from just pausing, including myself. I I uh sometimes I struggle with it. Like we had a I was just flowing the the group chat the other night with this conversation I was having, and I was just so done with it. Um, but any other time, I would have been like, I'm just going to leave it. It's not even worth my time. 
but for some reason I engaged and wasted my time. Do you find that even though you are trying to find this most optimal, efficient approach, that sometimes you are almost like battling yourself and trying not to stop yourself slipping into a conversation that you know will go to be a waste of time, but you do it anyway? Or is that just me? Um, that sounds like it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It's I think it's another skill. You know, sometimes the conversations do get heated. And the good thing about social media is you can take a break. I don't want to leave the conversation open so long that other people join in and it kind of changes the direction or pollutes the actual conversation that was happening. But I will take, you know, 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes and just really think about how I'm going to respond to something. And really, like, my phone notes are full full of these, of me writing out my response over and over in different ways until I feel satisfied with it. Like, it meets all my criteria. Like, is this going to make anyone mad? It shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> but if someone from the outside is going to read this, are they going to understand my point and be either agreeing with it or disagree with it, but understand where I'm coming from? You know what I mean? So I definitely take little mini breaks during those conversations and make sure I am in a calmer state before I respond. But I just don't want to leave it open so long that it loses its momentum. You know what I mean? You can't leave a conversation and come back a day later and try to pick it back up. So you almost kind of craft each and every response by rewriting it and, and combing it in that way. Yes, um, I think I fixate on it a little too much sometimes. <laughs> I respect I, it, though, because I'd never do that. Yes, I feel like it has to be as close to perfect as possible. And, like, perfect in the sense that I have tried my best to not offend anyone and to make my points in the most respectful way possible. And usually I try to include some sort of evidence in some way, whether that's like my own personal experience or documentation from a study or like citizen science of a video or photo of the animal basking in situ or climbing and whatnot. And unfortunately, sometimes that's not enough, but at least I have laid it out there for someone to look at and possibly they will look into it further. Yeah, it's just realize how good at admining you really are. <laughs> I I recently, for the first time, actually did a video response to a comment as a comment because I just was like, I can't bother to type this out and just did it. And it felt so much easier to add the tone and expression to fully understand the message. Uh, have you ever considered that before, or is that just scary? Um, I mean, I don't know. I guess it just depends on what it is being spoken about. I can see the benefit of it. Um, but also that relies on like Facebook actually working <laughs> and not corrupting the video in some way. Yeah, or their right, internet working. Um, yeah. Normally when I respond with videos, it's you, either a video I've already done, whether that's like footage from Instagram or a post I've made in the past, and I will like copy and paste the link to that. Especially when people ask about... Um, just as an example, like backgrounds and stuff, I'm always getting questions on how I do backgrounds and I usually comment with a video instead of typing a five paragraph essay because that can get a bit complicated. That was originally why I started my YouTube channel so that it was just resources I could just link. That is my response. That is my words that I can just put. Here's the link. So I have to type out over and over and over again. 
I've started like almost leaning away from Facebook nowadays because obviously this has taken up so much of my life and it pretty much is my life now. But the question for you I'd like to ask is, do you think Facebook is toxic? <laughs> um, yes and no. I think it can be. And I definitely think but I think it won't be as toxic as it can be if people avoid that side of it, if that makes sense. Like, I have gone from being in 30 Facebook groups to just, like, 10. Just to limit the toxicity and for my own mental well-being. You know, there's only so many boas and racks you can look at before you feel depressed for the rest of the day. And I, I feel um, that. I feel that a lot. Yeah, and um, so there's definitely, definitely can be toxic, but I also think it, you can limit it by being choosy on where you are and how you present yourself on Facebook. Here's a question based upon that then. Oh, I'm loving this conversation. So a lot of people talk about echo chambers and how you never want to be in an echo chamber because otherwise you are just insular, you don't grow. Do you feel that there's too much emphasis on, oh, I'm not in an echo chamber, I'm this like wider scoped person? Then let me think I want to ask this question actually. Do you think that's as important as people make it out to be? Or do you think it's important to protect your mental health if you don't want to be looking at people? talking in ways that upset you because you think oh how could people be talking about this it's like hello the 90s called they want the husbandry back or it's just the images of like conditions that upset you so does any part of yourself feel like oh i should be in some groups so i'm not in an echo chamber or do you feel like it's better to limit yourself to groups that you think are better um I think I think echo chambers can be good and bad. I think as far as like basic husbandry, echo chambers can be beneficial. As far as someone who's a novice and has no clue, like the very basics, they're confused. They got told this from a pet smart employee. They got told this from their cousin Craig who had a snake 20 years ago. And I think in that way, echo chambers... Are beneficial when you go okay hot spot this humidity this blah, blah blah but then it's also better to follow up with you know your humidity doesn't always have to be 60 percent. you can have a scope of a humid box that's 80 percent in this back corner that's 55 percent. it's not going to affect the snake it's going to move around and thermoregulate the same way with humidity as well i just like to throw I, when I answer questions like that, I like to add my own my own like experience to it and advice to it, especially when it comes to husbandry questions. I'm like, yes, you can do it this way, the echo chamber way, but it is better to do it this way. And I have experienced my animals doing this because I do it this way. And you do not need to worry about this because your animal can actually survive in all types of ranges of humidity. All that matters is you offer choices. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I just think it can be good and bad depending on the circumstance. So I want to go forward and double back because this will make sense once we get there. So obviously I'm trained to read and write and understand science. You came into this hobby from the other perspective. You have got into the reptile hobby and then wanted to go into a more academic route was i came out of academia fully un trained in understanding science and then came into the reptile hobby so i will never ever understand fully understand appreciate this perspective or this experience because i got to skip it how difficult was it coming into her best culture and seeing the emphasis on science but then having to like build the skill set and being able to actually interpret and understand and read scientific journals and whatnot. Yes. 
I love the abstract section <laughs> of the studies. I love it's just the the intricate details that I am still honing my skills on. But as far as like digesting the material as a whole, I feel like I've gotten a good basis on that. It was definitely really intimidating at first. Um, you know, you click this link and it's like, oh my gosh, this is five pages of information. Like, where do I find that one piece of information that is relevant to my question or what I was wondering about? Or is all five pages relevant to my question? Like, it is a lot. And I do think that a lot of people still misinterpret studies as far as when they try to cite things, they are actually, they have the information, but they are misunderstanding what the information is actually saying. Um, but I do see that like the hobby as a whole is starting to go to this more academic route. Like slowly but surely, I'm seeing a lot more people whenever they're having these heated discussions, they are citing sources for their arguments instead of just blindly saying things. And I think it makes a lot stronger argument as well all around. But yeah, it's definitely a lot from going from like not an academic background to going it reversed. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not sure if that answered your question or this not. This conversation <laughs> is so layered. You've got me making notes. No guest okay. has ever got me making notes before. So, what I would like to ask you, though, um, based upon all of that, what advice would you give past Victoria at the start of her journey? Um, to be creative. I definitely think when I first got in the hobby, I was trying to be like everyone else, straight from the cloth. This guy says to do it this way, I'm going to do it this way. This person says to do it this way, I'm going to do it this way. And I never really second-guessed anything or thought about ways to be creative, you know? And I just think if people were more creative with things, they'd find all kinds of different ways they can provide for their animal or enclosure setup to temperature ranges and different ways to provide humidity ranges. I don't know, a big thing for me is just being creative. Or to not be afraid to be creative. So almost a willingness to test things and dabble outside of the care guide. And these clearly defined boundaries that some people like to place. And so you have to walk down this lane. Yes, exactly. I mean, obviously, don't do anything dangerous. But, you know, you can push it a little bit and see what happens. <laughs> I think that as long as you're willing to pay... Um, this this actually this might be taking the wrong. Well, what I was going to say is, as long as you're willing to take an animal to the vets preemptively at any point, and you're willing to spend money, you can dabble a little bit. Because let's say you were like, right, I'm going to do a humidity gradient, and your brain was like, I can't, I can't. It has to be sixty, otherwise it's going to get an RI. But if the other part of you is like, I'll take it to the vet, I'll pay for the bills. Let, let's just try something in the case that this actually might be better for the animal. But if you were never willing to ever go to a vet and you don't, you completely just set on avoiding that scenario, you're always going to stick to the care guide because you know, I cannot, I cannot deviate in case that goes wrong. Yes. Yes. I agree completely. Um, that was just the advice I would give myself. I don't think everyone should be creative or dabble. Um, Cause there's definitely, you have to be, careful with it but i also think a lot of the care guides are missing a lot of things and especially when people use um let's say someone's using weather conditions from africa for their ball python you know but that's that weather in ghana for example is not actually the exact humidity and temperature they're experiencing on the ground or in the burrow or up in the tree if that's where they're at that point in time there's just a huge gradient of things. It's not as cut and dry as you look up the weather in that area and it's 60% humidity and 85 degrees. It's going to vary within the terrain in itself. Yeah, there's almost a layer of experience and not just experience keeping, but experience of having tried different 
like temperatures and it being fine to know that you can try things again and it's probably going to be fine and this experience of knowing that this reading doesn't isn't like wholly representative of the entirety of this bull python's life so there's there's this danger of these videos of going to the wild and taking like one surface temperature reading when there was no animal there it was just like oh yeah this the sun's booming on the ground here's temperature reading there you go there's temperature and then people were like using it as like a whole representation of this animal's like thermoregulation which is completely skewed but it takes a le level of experience to be like well this is only one part of the year one part of the day one part of this animal's reproductive cycle one part of is it digesting is it not digesting does it have parasite load the higher levels of you know, infrared might help like remove something or kill off something is it sick and trying to get infrared to heal there's so many different layers that you need to understand to realize that one one number means nothing yes exactly and i think that's a very interesting side of reptile keeping and it's something i really enjoy experimenting with but it is definitely, you know, it's not something everyone is comfortable with. And in that case, you know, there's nothing wrong with sticking to one number or aiming for one humidity gradient. Yeah. So doubling back then. So what I would like to say is talking about the echo chambers and people, you're starting to see people have arguments and or debates shall we say it so it just sounds less aggressive all the time <laughs> when we say have arguments it just sounds so toxic yeah when we have these like discussions and these debates over topics and you're starting to see people cite studies and cite resources are you just seeing that in ahh and not just pet rock or are you seeing that in the fringe groups that you're still part of yeah, I've been seeing it in the fringe groups and even just on people's personal profiles. Like I um, have befriended certain breeders because I was interested in the animals they were producing. And they will even have discussions on their personal pages. And you'll see people in the comments that are actually citing studies. And this isn't even in a community group or a discussion board. Like this is just someone's personal profile that happens to be friends with other reptile keepers and they are using these resources. I'm just noticing it a lot more. And I've also seen it as well outside of Facebook, like Instagram. I mean, it's not as easy to link things, but people will still bring up studies and they'll be like, I will DM you the link if you want it and things like that. I'm just seeing a lot more. And also people making their own diagrams for studies as well, like artistically, for certain studies and then they'll just have the study at the end or say link in their bio and whatnot. I'm just seeing a lot more information being freely circulated. And I like that a lot. So to build upon that, I like that by the way. So to build upon that and not being in your echo chamber, it's great if your echo chamber is all about like using science and, and going with the science. But how is important is it that we exist outside of our echo chambers and maybe the groups that aren't so science based, shall we say? And is it important that you are making points and backing things up with science to install the culture in these fringe areas as well? Or is that not your responsibility? You shouldn't take that upon yourself. Where do you draw the line? Um, heart hitting uh, questions. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I feel like if I see that and I take a look in the comments and I am seeing no one actually cite information and they're all just agreeing with each other on 90s, like a 90s care guide then I will feel that it is my responsibility to be that person who goes, wait a minute, um, I think everyone should take a look at X, Y, and Z. And you can have a look at this link here or perhaps just open iNaturalist. Look at, I mean, even um, herping videos are gaining in popularity on YouTube as well. You can see a lot of in-situ content, content there as well as where the animal 
is choosing to rest or if they're being seen crossing the road, climbing a tree, not just hiding 24-7. So yes, uh, as far as those arguments, if I'm seeing people are just honing in and agreeing with one another instead of actually having a discussion about the other side of keeping, then yes, I will take it upon myself to be that person. Linking back to mental health, do you think we take too much upon ourselves and feel like we have to take every... This is something my friend said to me. He he, he points this out about me in particular. He says that I always feel that I need to... I take all the problems onto my back and that I feel, I need to, I, I feel like I'm the person that has to march it all forward. Do you feel like there is too much of people taking on too much responsibility for themselves for something that isn't actually I don't want to say it's not serious because I truly believe it is very important and I believe in it 100% but do we always have to think oh this has to be me is this my responsibility I think it's easy to feel that way especially when you start to make a name for yourself so to speak because there's times where I necessarily I'm not in the best place and I don't want to involve myself in a certain discussion, but people are tagging me into it. You know what I mean? And then it's like, okay, so now I have to. (laughs) Otherwise, it's just awkward if people are asking you to contribute and you're just not going to. Um, But yeah, there's definitely a lot of emotion when it comes to animal keeping. And no one wants to feel like they're doing something wrong or harming their animal in a certain way. And it's definitely tough when you know that there's a better way to do things and you're seeing a species you love, a species that you know is so inquisitive and curious and active, being housed in a certain way that makes you feel sad. And you were like, I really wish that animal had better. That animal deserves better. So it's definitely a tough balance. In a world where animals can't speak, I think that sometimes someone somewhere needs to be their voice. But when and where that's appropriate is a very murky, very murky waters, I think. Yes. It's all about how you approach it, unfortunately. Yeah. Like we we want to speak from our heart, but sometimes speaking from your heart isn't the best approach to make people listen. Yeah, a lot of passion can go awry. Passion is great, yes. and people wouldn't have heated and uh, like very personal de- arguments if their passion wasn't there. Because without the passion, the argument wouldn't take place. Exactly. So to we're getting deep into this. <laughs> so. The other angle that I would like to talk about is that people see this growing culture of using science and citing studies to make their point. You see a, I'm going to link back to my experience the other night, you see an element of emulation without full understanding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain my experience the other night to the listeners. Um, So I saw a post and it posted this image and this image was a paragraph from a reptile textbook explaining how reptiles are not domesticated and they still are very much have natural species typical instincts and natural behaviors that are reliant upon elements of their wild history natural history shall i say and then someone posted that alongside with this is why bearded dragons hibernate in the summer in the northern hemisphere because they're remembering their instincts from Australia, where the sun, where the winter would be this time in Australia. Um, so they were citing as they have instincts; they're not domesticated, and then citing that as a proof of their opinion that of them hibernating in the reverse period. Now I can't wait to say this isn't the case, and I gave a lot of information about. Obviously, I started on the, the Beard of Dragon deep dive before I started the Ball Python one. Bearing in mind, I've got like hundreds of hundreds of studies in a spreadsheet and I've read a lot. That isn't the case, and I know that's not the case. It's just that during the summertime, 
they actually go sort of dormant and are far less active in the wild where the temperatures are so hot they'll they'll bask at very early periods and then very late in the afternoon and they'll actually sleep in trees and that's because the snakes become active at higher temperatures in the summer and they want to be in a position where if they see a snake coming or they wake them up they can just drop and then run so i was explaining that a lot of the things that people think is hibernation is just inactivity because that's what they do in the summer in the wild um and then in response i was asked to like link my sources and i said blah 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 blah, blah these are sources and i said i'm really open to, to seeing some studies that show that there's a, this instinctual remembrance of the reverse seasons in australia can you link it and they just sent a picture of the textbook cover and I was like, this isn't a citation. I'm talking about a study that, that proves this actual premise. And then they said, well, the power, the, the, the picture I put in the original post was proof of the citation of, the, of proof of it. And then started citing the references for this paragraph, for this chapter, as all the other researchers that agreed with her opinion. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You've gone a whole weird direction with this. You can't cite that they have instincts, but then use that as a citation of your opinion. You need to actually have a study that is linked to the thing you're talking about, or at least similar species that you can like draw comparisons because they're the same genus or something like that. But to talk about like all these all these references for this chapter that was talking about things completely, completely unrelated, as all these researchers agree with me, these experts agree with me. There's an element of emulation of citing but not a full understanding how do we navigate this element of things and help these people that are trying to, to to take part in this but don't fully understand but also how do we navigate that element of if someone that is fully against the sort of these ideas seeing that and then citing become almost like a a joke to certain types of people where it's making a mo almost making a mockery in some circles of something very very scientific and valid or does that not matter because science is science and so what if someone's trying to play ball but don't fully understand that doesn't that doesn't devalue the actual science per se do you understand what i'm getting at or have i just swayed and meandered <laughs> too much there no, I understand. Um, me personally, I think it's about self-awareness. You know, just because you can read the words in the the study doesn't necessarily mean you're understanding its full message. And that's not to call someone, not to tell someone they're not intelligent. It's just like that's a lot to digest. These studies were conducted by multiple scientists, went through peer review, however many months the actual study took place, having all that information condensed. It's a lot to digest just reading it, you know? And it's not to say that someone is less intelligent than others. It's just a skill that people have to learn. And me personally, I know I don't fully have that skill and it is something I'm working on. And at that point, I reach out to people who I feel are more versed in studies and I will ask them questions and I will say, you know, to me, this study in this paragraph in this section is saying X, Y, and Z. Do you agree or do you think I am misunderstanding this completely? You know, I think there should definitely be some more like inner support between people, especially the people who've been in the hobby for a while, who have been doing this side of the keeping for a while, kind of just sharing how they got to where they are or sharing how they understand things. You know, I think it was, I mean, I'm not going to comment on that person in particular, but to me, it's clear that you are more versed, like well-read in the study and you are understanding it more. If I was in their shoes, I wouldn't have fought against you. <laughs> I would have been like, okay, what am I missing that you're seeing? And how am I misinterpreting this? Like, I tried to find a common middle ground of, like, where the miscommunication was happening. 
but that in itself is a skill set. You know, a lot of people aren't self-aware enough to think that way. So it's just complicated. People are complicated. Yes, they they, they certainly are. Um, so how do you feel we can be more effective at that in helping helping share our journeys of how we actually learn to interpret studies and helping people along the way? Because I've always thought about like making some sort of resource, but I, I feel like if I made a course, then no one's going to use it. <laughs> oh, no. But how do we, as a just generically in conversation, how do we install this skill set? How do we help people along the way? How do we become more effective? Um, I definitely think like your deep dives are a great way of helping people learn how to break down information. I definitely think more things like that are exactly what we need to avoid confusion and what these stud these studies are actually about. Because we all want to, or no, I wouldn't say we all, but most of us are trying to elevate the hobby, pediculture, and the way to do it is through science. You know, it's not through what you can breed. It's, it's through the science and the animal's actual behavior and what they their instincts and what they're actually meant to do, not just make pretty babies. <laughs> so I definitely think using studies is the way to go to elevate the hobby as a whole. Now there's a clip for the start of the start of the podcast. <laughs> uh, is it? <laughs> yes. Bingo. <laughs> right, cue the deep dive advert. <laughs> I'm joking, no. I'll put it at the start. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so there's an element of that of everyone's wanting to advance the hobby and bring up this new this upper echelon of like understanding and getting to a higher welfare standard so that everyone can get there i have struggled with patience in the past where i've always had this sort of like thought of in the back of my head this like impending doom we're going to lose the hobby before we get there or we need to get there faster as the best defense to defending against like losing a hobby to like aunties and positive lists and whatnot. Do you feel we're too impatient? Do you think that's unrealistic or do you think that if we're more patient, that it's going to be more effective? Oof, I definitely feel you on the impending doom feeling, you know, <laughs> They definitely come in waves, you know, something crazy happens and then we're like, oh, this is it. This is, it's happening right now. But then things subside, kind of seems like it's going back to normal. And then we have some other big event where it just feels like white lists are coming and the hobby is about to be super regulated. And I don't know, it's, it definitely has been coming in waves. I have noticed a trend <laughs> over the years where there's just waves of impending doom and then waves of, okay, so since we didn't doom ourselves that time, we really need to buckle our boots and do better now, you know, before we waste our chances. And I do think as stressful as these events can be, they have been kind of helping speed things up as far as elevating the hobby and reaching a point where we are doing what is best for the animals to where there's nothing that could be used against us. I mean, obviously there's still stuff that can be used against us, but I just feel like every time we have this impending doom moment, the hobby as a whole elevates faster because of it does that make sense mm -hmm. there was a conversation that i had with with my well at my time boss from the job that i've just quit um and he said he said what you're doing is great but i think you need more patience and it goes in what way he goes if you're feeling like we need to get everything done now before we lose it all but he said to me, I have seen this hobby change for 30 years and things have advanced in ways that I've never even seen before. The feeling that you're feeling now has always been there and it'll never not be there. 
but yet we were still existed for 30 years. So the patience is what's required because that's always going to feel that way. That's actually kind of a wonderful thing that he said. It definitely yeah. puts perspective on it. Because obviously I haven't been around for 30 years. <laughs> and it's just being here for a few years, you get so passionate that you just want everything to change immediately. And it is a bit unrealistic to say that it will. But keeping that perspective of the change that has happened over a long period of time is definitely humbling and kind of gives you more of a sense of hope instead of just drowning in doubt in the moment. Yeah, another analogy I saw use was um, someone else said, the hobby is like an oil tanker. Um, and a lot of people at the moment want to turn around like a speedboat, but obviously it's not going to happen. It's, it's slow and meandering. And it takes a long time for it to, for it to change in advance. Yeah. I feel like that could be said about animal keeping across like all boards, really. I, I believe so. My favorite one is something that Paul from the Captive Raptors podcast or Paul's monitors, shout out to Paul. What he said was, you've got to sow seeds and you sow these seeds of showing what you're doing and how cool it is and showing that you're using science to do this with your animals, and showing that there is this other path like you were shown. Um, and then they, they themselves decide, I want to take part of that. I want to do it that way. And then they join you on the journey and not telling them that like you're doing it wrong. This is bad, blah, 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 blah. So, so they shut down and don't take part, but you're sowing the seeds to make the start of their journey. And he goes at the moment, you're trying to shove an oak tree up their ass. Oh, <laughs> that's my favorite. one. Yes. I definitely agree with Paul's stance. I definitely prefer the lead by example approach. It definitely, it just gets people thinking. It makes people curious, you know? It just, even if they don't understand at the moment, just the fact that they are curious about it is enough to kind of get the, the ball rolling. So I, th I think it, my, my next question on the list was actually, do you think it's a lack of patience we display? And I'm like, I think we've both answered that, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> Here's a cool question. If there was a magical way to make everyone behave online, what would it be? Oh. Oh. I don't know. Um, I feel like it's just the usuals, you know, like being respectful, talking to people the same way you would want to be spoken to, kind of being level-headed during discussions even if you don't agree with what is being presented to you just responding in a calm manner instead of you know just going off and telling them to screw themselves and blocking them but it's definitely <laughs> a, a magical place because i don't think we'll ever be there <laughs> I'd imagine that is certainly the case. So you've <laughs> been an admin now on AHH for a long while. How many? How long have you been an admin for? Oof, I don't even know. I'd have to look. I'd say like one and a half years is my estimate. Possibly. I genuinely have no concept of time. Because I have <laughs> been like contributing in AHH for so long. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like I'm doing all the same things I was doing before I got the fancy badge. The fancy badge. <laughs> the, the fancy, fancy payroll. <laughs> oh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> so was there anything during this time that you were surprised was so challenging? Um, honestly, kind of the way that people kind of laugh at the, the admin position. Like, the, you know, there's sometimes those instances where people just don't want to listen and they're like, you're just an admin. It doesn't mean anything. This is just a Facebook group. And, and they have a point, but it's not something I ever experienced until I got the badge because I'm still presenting myself and discussing the same way I was before. But mm -hmm. it's like now when someone's unhappy with me, they're like, just because you're an admin doesn't mean anything. Like, that's like their fallback. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I've seen that a few times. And I'm so, just like, all right. Almost before they would engage in your point and engage in your argument. Now they'd resort to like this ad hominem of being like, ah, you're an admin. Yes. It's almost, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it doesn't happen often. It's just happened a few times where I was like, wow, that is the first time I've had that sort of response. And I don't know how to respond back. Mm. It's just odd. Like, it's almost as if they think I'm doing like a power move, but really I'm not. I'm just discussing the same way I always had. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So you obviously watched me um, a long time ago. I remember you submitting enclosures to the original enclosure reviews and things like that a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here's a question for you, uh, more for me, to be fair. Is there anything about the way that I communicate that you think uh, has improved or you think still could be better in the way that I run this channel, the way I do things? I'm looking for feedback. I've got my pen here. I think you have done like so much better at communicating your point. I definitely think when you first started your channel, it was a lot of there was like a lot of passion. And there still is the passion. I just think you've kind of put a filter on it. And it's a filter in a way where people are more receptive. Does that make sense? It's kind of like what we've been talking about this whole time. Yeah. <laughs> but I have noticed it a lot in your channel, like looking at your old videos. In comparison to now, you just present yourself much more like level headed instead of definitely sh definitely showing more emotion. Like, yes, showing less of an emotional appeal and more of a level headed, direct. This is the papers. This is what they say. There's no misinterpretation. There's. It's not a lie. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think I originally was trained to read science and also write science and do all of this and got the qualifications, but I never actually trained to be an educator or have the skill set or the patience to educate and help others. So it's, I've also had the ability to interpret the science and the intelligence to make the point and share the information. But I'm, I think I'm slowly, as time goes on, developing the wisdom to apply lenses, as if you say. Yes, that's the perfect way to put it. I'm saving yeah. that for later. Putting on the lens. Yeah, the lenses. I'm, I'm, I'm loving analogies lately. Everyone's applying <laughs> analogies to everything, and I'm like, they're perfect. <laughs> well, I think we've been going for an hour and a half now. Um the last thing that I would like to ask you is something that I would like to bring new to the podcast because I watched another podcast and I just liked it. So I'm going to steal it. I would like you to leave a question for the next guest and I'll get them to answer when they come on. Any question you like, um, obviously reptile related. Give them a question. Do they think that there needs to be more species diversity in the hobby? Good question. Or Oh, carry that on. is my question. No, that's my question. Do they need, does there need to be more species diversity in the hobby? Okay, that'll be yes. given to next guest, and then they're going to ask <laughs> another question. We're going to get this trail of questions from guest to guest. I like yes. this. I've stolen this. <laughs> I don't care. It's mine now. Perfect. But yeah, that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for coming on, Victoria. It's just been like a really deep layered conversation. You maybe get out a notepad and pen. That's how far we took this. I've really enjoyed it. So thank you very much for coming on. If anyone wants to get in contact with you, where can they find you? I assume on your Instagram account. Yes, mostly my Instagram, Passionate Snakes. And yeah, I mean, if you see me on Facebook, feel free. <laughs> I will answer messages there as well, but mainly through Instagram. Thank you so much, Victoria. I really love this episode. This episode, I've just edited this. I've just sat back through it. And honestly, my brain went five different directions, spiraling off different points that were made during this. I loved this episode. Truly, truly, truly. This is probably one of the favorite podcasts I've recorded. I... 
I personally gained so much at this conversation and I'm really thinking that people listening to you, Victoria, will too. So thank you so much for your time and your patience with my babbling halfway through this and the difficult questions that I posed to you. I really appreciate you having this conversation with me. And for all the listeners, thank you very much for sticking with us throughout this conversation. Thank you so much for the Patreon supporters for making this possible and now making this my job so that I can hang out with you guys as much as possible and be as consistent as much as possible. I appreciate everyone that is helping me be in a position to help others and that really gets me up every day excited, truly. Thank you, Custom Reptile Habitats, for sponsoring us and making this possible again. If you would like to get some premium PVC enclosures, you can head on over to the website linked in the description, Custom Reptile Habitats, for premium PVC enclosures. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.